Welcome to The Storm. My name is David Yankai from the LULAC Political Letter. Do not change that dial. The Storm's host, Tiffany Cloud, has asked me to host the show because her special guest tonight is Tiffany Cloud. Tonight, we'll put the host on the hot seat and asking the questions will be her favorite liberal, me. We'll be back with all the intriguing possibilities of this on WYLN TV 35. We're back on The Storm on WYLN-TV. My name is David Yonke. My guest tonight, her guest tonight, is Tiffany Cloud. And Tiffany, I have a question for you. Yes. Do you remember what I pulled out the very first time we met when we had lunch at the Roadhouse? Yeah, it was weird. Okay. It was, it was well, it wasn't, it wasn't a wad of cash, so I was really disappointed in that. Yes. No, it was a, uh, a list of questions, my friend. That's right. Every yes. time I talk to somebody who I haven't seen in years or who I have questions for and I have, you know, intriguing possibilities for wh who they are or whatever, I always try to uh, put out a list of questions. And tonight I have a list of questions that is, is not dissimilar to what we were asking when I first met you about four years ago. Okay. Um, basically... This program is one of the most popular political programs in northeastern Pennsylvania. What led you to the storm? Oh, okay. Um, well, a couple different things, Dave. First of all, thank you for hosting. Um, this is an I, honor. I'm clearly going to lose my job. <laughs> no, you're um, not. And you're dressed way better than I ever <laughs> no, do, no, so no, thank no. you. Um, what really led me to do the show was a couple things. Uh, first of all, I felt that there was a real need for a show based in the greater Hazleton area. I mean, granted, we cover all through Wilkes Ferry and, and down through Mahanoy City, but I felt we needed a show in the greater Hazleton area where there would be tough questions asked, um, and I felt it was important that the guests who come on could be heard. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to be a host who asked the question but then shut up and listen to the answers, and I felt that we needed that in local television. Yeah, that's very important. Um, and I also thought it would be good to have a point of view from a female as well. Um, you know, obviously there are some wonderful females on the radio, but there weren't really many women or any women doing this kind of political talk show hosting, and so I wanted to get out there and doing it. Doing it, and I'd say thirdly. Um, you hear so many bad things about our area. You know, mm -hmm. at the time I was getting into this, we had the whole crisis down at the courthouse and all the scandals going on, the kids for cash thing happening, you know, judges going to jail. And it was a really, really low point. And um, I wanted to make sure to, A, hold people accountable so that we would never see dark days like that again. Mm -hmm. um, and B, I wanted to make sure that positive stories were told as well. Right, and I think you did a good balance of asking the hard questions, but also bringing informative things to people who may not have known about a particular issue or anything I, like that. I try. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think we all like to learn. Yeah. I like to learn. I mm -hmm. love to have guests on the show that teach me about things. And mm -hmm. even though I am a conservative and I'm very open about being a conservative, as you well know, being from the other side of the aisle, I'm open to listening to other perspectives. I may not always agree with them, but I will listen because I don't think we learn anything and we don't grow unless we hear different points of view. Who are your most, who are your most, uh, and please exclude me out of this, who are your most um, important and interesting interviews that you don't forget, that you always okay. remember? Okay. Um, for sure, I would say um, United States Senator uh, Pat Toomey. Okay. I mean, it's an honor to get to interview any U.S. senator. There's only two, two per state. Who will make the time to come in to right. a station. Right. I, I, exactly. I was really honored. I was his only stop when he was in the greater Hazleton area a couple months ago, and I was really appreciative that he came on. And, and I get really excited about world issues, national issues. I mean, uh, the terrorism that's going on facing this world today is of concern. It's mm -hmm. something I question him a lot on. So I enjoyed that uh, particular show. I was extremely humbled um, when I had the opportunity to interview a man well into his 90s who was one of the last living survivors of the bombing at Pearl Harbor. Right. Mm -hmm. um, a local man from the uh, the Hazleton area. Uh, that, that stood out. Um, you know, I, I always enjoy political shows, candidates. I like to find out why people are running for office, why people are willing yeah. to put themselves on the line and, and run, because that's tough duty. 
So yeah. I enjoy every political interview. It is, and you know, I really think, and I've always said this a number of times, that the second most patriotic thing that anybody could do for their country is actually run for office. And the first one, obviously, is serving in the military, but I think that, you know, anybody who puts himself out there and their families out there, that's a big thing. Absolutely. Now, is there anybody where, when you did the interview, you're driving home, and you're thinking to yourself, what was I thinking? Is there anybody that you ever had like that oh, thinking to yourself, gosh. my heavens, am I going to lose my job? What, what is going well, on? You know, I'm going to be kind enough not to name any okay. names, but I will say the hardest interviews are the people who just give you a, a quick, you know, even if it's an open-ended question, you get mm. a very brief answer and you have to keep digging and digging and digging. Yeah. You know, communication is natural for someone like you. It's natural for someone like me. This is what we do. It's not necessarily natural for everybody who is in various positions. And, and so the hardest interviews are people that are really just um, uncomfortable expressing. And, and more so, the, the interviews that, that I find most difficult are when a person's trying to evade the question. Yeah. You know, if you mm -hmm. act a direct, if I ask you a direct question that's either black or white, I'd like a black or white answer. Mm -hmm. People who like to blather around in the land of the gray and not really answer mm -hmm. my question, I mean, I'm going to keep asking you, mm -hmm. but I find that frustrating. I, I, I appreciate people who just put it out there. How about the people who basically keep on saying the same thing over and over again? Like, in other words, like you'll ask them the question and they won't be answering your question, but they'll be saying the same thing over and over again, like reading script. And I bet you would just want to slap them. Well, and that happens a lot with people running for office. Mm. You know, they tend to want to, and I'm sure a lot of the times it's because they've been coached to do so. You know, yeah. don't make any mistakes, don't say anything wrong, stay in this little box of, of uh, you know, uh, statements you're going to make. Your bag of tricks. Yeah, your bag of yeah. tricks. But you know, at the end of the day, that they, it gets awfully rote and and trite and uh, rather dull, I think, for the listener. So, mm -hmm. um, for the most part, I would say I've had the good fortune of booking guests who have. Uh, not presented me with situations like, like that. All right, now look, here's another question that I have, and I think a lot of people are probably wondering about this. What do you do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you laugh, okay, that's the okay. start. Well, yeah. you know, it's funny because I'm actually such an intense person. Yes, that's why, that's why I asked the I question. I get this because, a lot. Yeah. You know, I, I come across as a very intense person. I am admittedly a pretty intense person, but believe it or not, I actually have a wicked sense of humor. Oh, yeah. I love a good laugh, usually at my own expense. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in terms of fun, you know, in the summer I play a lot of golf. Oh, I really? Yeah. yeah, I've been doing that uh, competitively since I was a little kid. Um, I think golf is a great metaphor for life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the wind's with you, sometimes against you. Sometimes there's an obstacle, sometimes there isn't. Sometimes you're on, sometimes you're off. Yeah. I do a lot of that. I write, um, spend time with the family. Right. So, yeah. so golfing, I think that's pretty interesting that uh, you've been doing golfing since you since you were like a child. Right? Yeah, a since long I was time. 12 years now, old. Who started that? Who, who inspired you to do that? Your oh, my mom, parents. Your mom my and dad? parents, yeah. yeah. They, they said, you know, <laughs> Well, they actually said two things. They said, I'll teach you a lot about character right. and resilience. And they said also, uh, on the golf course, a lot of business deals are struck, and you don't want to miss out on those things. All right. Well, that's good. Uh, we'll be back on the storm with uh, Tiffany Cloud. We're back on the storm. I'm David Yankai, along with Tiffany Cloud, who is our own guest tonight. And we were talking about your book. Mm -hmm. well, actually, we weren't talking about your book. We were talking about fun. And I had, I had thought about asking you the question, did you have fun writing your book? And I'm asking you that question because and when I was working on mine, I didn't have fun. Yeah. I was just, it was like intense. When you wrote that wonderful book, um, you know, about, uh, you know, uh, sleeping with dog tags, what was the process? Was it fun? Did you have moments where you thought, oh my heavens, it's tough to write? Tell me yeah, about that. Well, for me, I don't know if fun would be the word to describe it. For me, mm -hmm. I wrote, it was really therapy. I, I wrote Sleeping with do well, Dog Tags when my husband was on his third uh, tour of duty with Special Operations Forces. He was in Afghanistan in a very dangerous place in the Hindu Kush. Mm -hmm. um, and I, control freak as I am, which I am, you know, being a military wife later in life, first time, 
I learned very quickly, I have no control what's going on over yes. there. You know, people, I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what missions he's on. I don't know, you know what's happening. He can't call. I can't pick up the phone and call. And the only thing I could control, Dave, was the strokes on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So writing for me, I wouldn't say it was fun. It was more therapeutic. I got out anger. I got out horror. I got out fear, frustration. And I never wrote really intending to write a book. I was just writing to get through all the sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. When I got about 50 pages in, I thought, oh, well, this might make a nice little memoir so that people could understand what it's like, at least for some of us, um, the military spouse who's at mm -hmm. home, whether a loved one's at war, because you hear about war from the perspective of the veteran a lot. Right. You seldom hear it from the perspective of the spouse. People will always ask, how do you write a book? And you really don't, I, I mean, it happens. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when you said that, you know, you were just writing for therapy, and then all of a sudden you see this body of work and you, and you think to yourself, wait a minute, I could string this together. So, yes. yeah, that's true. Yes. I was just wondering, because you had alluded before when we were talking about fun, that sometimes you write. What do you actually write for fun? Or oh. is that, a, 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 you know. Well, I've, I've obviously that book. Besides that the to-do list for your husband. Yeah, I do lots of those, <laughs> sure, and yes. nothing gets crossed <laughs> off, or <laughs> at least it takes a long time. Um, I've actually, over the last few years, I've written for a few uh, national blogs, political blogs, okay. um, a few uh, national websites, um, mostly conservatively bent. I've written for an online magazine um, articles about being a military spouse and about veterans' issues, which mm -hmm. I'm a strong advocate for. Ad, um, I believe in advocating for our veterans and our military families, so I've done a lot of writing in that regard. Right. So primarily that. I've been working on a book um, which is a fiction book, unlike my first book, which was my own story. I've been working on something. Um, have yet to decide how far I'm going to take it. We'll see. Well, you know what's going to happen. You're not going to. You, you think you're, you think you think you have an ending now, and you won't. Right. The, the ending will come right. And out you of know your, this because yeah. you've written a ton of books yourself. Uh, so only you three. Know. Only yes, three. Well. But, uh, I'm going to ask you this. Uh, tonight we found out that Arizona passed a bill that. Um, mandated that high school seniors pass a civics test. And this is kind of, um, um, not ironic, but this is kind of poignant for me because, you know, ever since we met and we've been on the air together and, you know, offset on WYLN, um, you've talked about how important voting is and yes. how some people don't, you know, take voting for granted. Um, do you think, obviously you think this is a good idea, but you had mentioned that maybe, uh, what the, what, what's the graduate rate, yeah, rate going to uh, yeah, be? Yeah, we were talking about this at break. I mean, I, I think it's a fabulous idea. I yeah. think that, you know, we need people to understand our form of government. You know, people nowadays don't even realize there's the judicial, the executive, the legislative. They mm -hmm. think the buck stops with the president. It actually does not. Right. It, it can law can always be re rewritten it goes back to the legislator the power is mm -hmm. ultimately in we the people's hands um, I think it's important that our young people understand this country I think it's sad that our immigrants who as they're working to become citizens they often because they have to pass tests no more than our yeah. own citizens do basic things like who's the vice president who's secretary of state I mean we really should know these things and and yes I, I'm a strong believer we need to get more people voting not just in presidential election years but in the off years because you know the the council races the mm -hmm. mayoral races all politics is ultimately local yeah and uh, there's been far too much apathy in our region. We have far too often times where it's only 30% turnout, and that to me is unacceptable. Right, and you know what happens sometimes, I remember it came home to me a couple of years ago during the last gubernatorial election, um, a person I work with said, oh, well, I don't vote for, I, I only vote for presidential elections. And I said, yeah, but this guy's controlling your taxes. Absolutely. You know? and, and, and at the local level, too. All right, who's your favorite president? Oh. Think about this now. Okay, now I have a couple, I, and you, you have a couple. That's good. And if you want yeah. to do century by century, that's okay. Well, I, I have a feeling that this century it's not going to be Obama. But uh, you know, like well, I said, if you tell were me. Ask me my least favorite president. That would have been a layup <laughs> answer because for sure it would have been Obama. All right. Okay. Um, but by a by a lot, um, I would say uh, you know John Adams certainly okay. a fabulous president had so much to do with the foundation of this nation and is often unsung. 
Um, you know, a lot of people give credit to uh, Washington or they give credit to Jefferson. They don't necessarily understand just how much John Adams had to do with shaping our Constitution and our laws and how um, important he was in terms of foreign relations, etc. So um, he's high, high up there. You know, obviously, uh, the Republican as I am, I'm a fan of Reagan, um, what he did uh, amidst the Cold War. Um, he took a nation in a time that I feel is rather similar to the times we're facing now, where he was coming off of Carter and uh, you know, the nation, the, the morale was low. We, we, we were perceived as weak on a global scale, leading from behind. Um, and Reagan really took a strong stance, and um, he put us back out front. And, and I am hopeful in 2016 a person will run for office that can take us back to being the leaders of the free world. Um, I find it appalling that there were just a number of people killed exercising their right to free speech in Paris, France, yeah. and our own president could not march arm in arm with the likes of Benjamin Netanyahu, who was marching not a few feet away from the head of Palestine. I mean, if they could get together, it's shameful that um, Obama wasn't there or Biden wasn't there, well, in my view. Yeah, and, and, I, and, and, you know, the White House has said that, you know, they, uh, they're not good at optics. And, oh, you know, please, they and, live and, for and, optics. And, and, and That's I, all they're about. And, and I think they proved that, although there could have been, you know, considerations going on. But, yeah, I think they should have sent somebody. Yes. And, I, and I'm thinking the perfect guy probably would have been John Kerry. Well, and, of course, because, I mean, and he it could speaks have been, French, well, and he and, would have and been... And listen, Eric yeah. Holder was in Paris for crying yes. out loud. It's mm -hmm. not like he had to go very far. So, right. um, you know, bottom line is I think that we need people with intestinal fortitude to step up and put us out in front again to mm -hmm. be the courageous. We need courage back. Uh, I, I sometimes wonder where our leaders have gone. <laughs> Who do you think in 2016 would be a viable candidate that, number one, would have the principles that your wing of the Republican Party would like, but also would be able to win? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting. There's a real schism in the Republican Party right now which with, um, you know, sort of the, the Tea Party to the right, right, which a lot of people don't understand. The Tea Party are simply people that adhere strongly to the Constitution. That's really what they are. They're constitutionalists. So, you know, there are people like a Ted Cruz who certainly might make a very good president, but there's, you know, Jeb Bush may as well. I just hope he rethinks Common Core if he decides to run. We'll talk a little bit more about that because that's a, a, a very important thing that we're going to be talking about on The Storm. We'll be right back. Back on The Storm. My name is David Yankai with Tiffany Cloud. Tiffany, you were making a point about the 2016 election. I just want you to wrap up on that a little bit. Yeah, I just want to add that my main thing is that, you know, I don't know yet who I'm going to back, but my main thing is I don't want to see 10 Republicans going at it with each other. Mm -hmm. I want us to pretty quickly pick our horse and back our horse. Let's go at it with the other side this time. That's a good idea because you really have to have you don't, the last time you had like 12 people debating in like it 2013, long. it was crazy. All right, now you and Eric, okay, you and Eric um, have open seats at a dinner table, all right? He doesn't care. He's out with Sarge the dog. You could invite four guests oh, from wow. history. From history? From history. Who would the guests be from history? Now, Eric doesn't care. He says, honey, do what you want. You know, invite oh, who well, you for are. a fabulous dinner party. For, for a fabulous oh, dinner, and have, they have to be historical figures. I would have Jesus. Okay. I would have, just to mix it up, I'd have Patton. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd have Ayn Rand. Okay, that's interesting, all right. I wasn't expecting that one. I should have been expecting that mm. one, but wasn't expecting that one. And then just to throw it in, just to make it crazy, I'd have Karl Marx, too. Really? Yeah, that would be one heck of a dinner party. That Really incredible, <laughs> and you know the, the 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 best part about it is you didn't pick the people that I thought. I thought, oh, she's going to pick Lincoln, she's going to pick no. Jefferson, you know, and everything like that. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you want to have a dinner party, you want to have it get a little crazy. I yeah. mean, imagine, imagine that'd be that'd be a that'd that would be, be a interesting riot. to see Pat and say, why did why why did my brakes fail, Jesus? <laughs> but anyway, um, all right, now. Uh, what, what would the audience be surprised to learn about you in terms of, you know, some other things that you're working on at this point? Oh, well... I, uh, get, I guess I'm dancing around a question, okay? I'm dancing okay. around the question. Have you ever considered running for office yourself? 
Ooh. in terms of, and, and, and if you were going to run for office, what office would you run for? Yes, I have considered. Okay. Um, if I were to run, it would probably be United States Congress. Okay. Sim simply because I'm passionate about um, national issues, as I talked about. Um, I never say never. Um, I obviously would not plan on running any time in the near future um, while uh, Congressman Barletta is. Um, and I don't know, I mean, part of me says no because I'm actually pretty introverted. I'm not really a press the flesh kind of person. But um, if the right time came and enough people said, you know, and encouraged me and said, we'd really like you to consider it, I would never say never to doing it down the road. If you, if, okay, if you were in a position of power, okay, a Congress, whatever, how would you go about, like, trying to make things a little bit better in terms of the communication between the two sides? Because it just seems like everybody is dug in and entrenched. And the one person who has, I feel, worked um, to a certain extent with the Republicans has been Congressman Cartwright and even Congressman Barletta. They're, they're, they're level-headed in the sense that they realize, you know, they have to work with other people. How would you try to accomplish that? Well, again, I mean, I think when you're elected, people have to remember you're you're representing your constituents. Right. So ultimately, you have to listen to your district, and the district, the 11th Congressional District, for example, is um, considerably more D than R. So you have to listen to those points of views. I mean, you have to try to find issues that matter. Some Everybody's got to get some kind of a win. Ultimately, right. though, where I wouldn't compromise myself is I would never compromise when it comes to taxes. I would keep them low. Mm -hmm. And um, I would never compromise in terms of our veterans. One, one of the things I don't like is the Paul Ryan budget, which our congressman did support, is that it capped the cost of living increase on our veterans. I didn't like that he supported that. All right. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, we're at the end of our program. And as uh, Tiffany always says... Don't complain if, about it, folks. Do something about it. And thank you for watching. And thank you, Dave Yonkai, for hosting. Happy to be here. Thank you.